Well, good morning, everyone. If we're in the room, why don't we stand? And those of you joining us online, we're so honored to have you with us this morning. If I've never had the chance to meet you, my name is Missy, and I just wanted to take a moment and welcome all of us this morning. With today being Father's Day, it's a very special moment for us to engage and honor the men that are in our lives and those that are in our world, the, the men that have laid down their lives, work so hard to provide for their families and speak into us and call us up to higher things and train us and do all of those things that a father, a good father does. So I know that whether you're in the room or watching online, your dad is probably on your mind this morning. But I wanted to take us for a second to focus our attention on our Heavenly Father. Whether you have your, your dad here with you or not, you are not fatherless. We all have a dad. And we've got a good one. And he's kind and he's patient. He's faithful. He's enduring to the end. He's full of love. And he wants to give us hope today. And so as we go through this service, we take a little time to focus on him and, and listen to what he has to teach us in his word. I just wanted to read this over us as we step into worship this morning. It's found in Psalms 27, and we'll start in verse 4. And this is my heart's cry for all of us as a gift, in a sense, to our Heavenly Father. One thing I have desired of the Lord. There's so many things we desire in life, right? We bring to him. But this is the most important thing that I will, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up. Come on, do you need your head lifted up today? He is the one that does that. He is the lifter of our heads. And today, he wants to do that for some of us. My head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. We may not feel like it at times, but today we're going to give it to him anyway. We're going to worship him with joy. And I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. This morning, let's sing praises to our God. He's worthy to be praised in the good times and in the bad. He's worthy to be praised. He's a good, good father. So let's sing to him this morning. Let's join in and worship our father together. Dad, we love you and we honor you. As Jesus called you Abba, Father, Daddy, God, we cry out to you in that aspect today. We honor you as the good father. The one that we all look to, the one that created us, the one that knows us better than anyone else. The one that walks by our side, that puts your arms around us when we need it. The one that cheers us on, the one that corrects us when it's desperately needed to keep us on the right path. You're a good father. And this one thing we desire as your children to be in your house today and to worship you. So come and fill this space. We know you're already here, but we recognize it. Holy Spirit, bring comfort where it's needed today. We sing praises to your name in Jesus' name. Come on, church, let's worship him. Good morning, Highway. the 
God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me, for me. my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faith. that shepherd boy courageous who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face the lion but I've got my own giants oh God my God I need you oh God my God I need you now standing on his face. Oh, rock. Oh, rock. Oh, rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Lord, on your heard your children. Provide and you'll provide. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are oh, come on. The same you move, moved in power.
my God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, oh, oh. oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. we thank you. We praise you. We honor you today. You are Father. You've been a great Father. You've always remained the same. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your consistency. We thank you for showing up. We thank you for overlooking us, Lord. Thank you for keeping us safe, protecting us, all the blessings you bestowed upon us, Lord. We praise you for that. We glorify your name. You're worthy to be praised, Lord. You're worthy to be It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. 
perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for being perfect. Thank you, Lord, for being absolutely perfect. Every measure of you is perfection, Lord, and we thank you for, for being able to call your friend and your, and your children, Lord. We praise and glorify you, Lord. We praise and we glorify you. So good. It's good. Well, like I've already said, welcome to church, everyone. We're so glad that you're here with us in this yeah. space and in this room with us. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? So we've got something special today that Come we get on. to do, and um, I can't imagine a, a better day to do something like this on. We True. get to dedicate a beautiful baby today, and so I just, can we give the Tiger family a hand as they come, come on, on up? Come on up, Ryan Mercedes. Such a precious, precious family, and in our church come family, so y'all right just here. come right up here and hey, stand next to me. We're excited to get to be a part of this uh, today, and we as a family get to interact with this with them as they step into a special moment where they are dedicating, um, yes, rise, but really themselves to the Lord to raise him according to scripture, what God yeah. calls rise to become and be. And so this is a beautiful time it's to good. get to be a part it's of it. good. I'm just going to give you a heads up because here in a second you're going to hand over rise and you got a light right above his head. So just just give you a heads up right now. Don't want him crying when you pass him to Pastor Missy. So yeah, bud. And I like the matching shirts. Come on. Good job, Rise. Way to pick that out for your for your dad today. Nice. Well, Proverbs 22, 6 says, dedicate your children to God. Point them in the way they should go. And the values they've learned from you will be with them. For life, you know, you know, this is a kind of a dual thing. We just got to do a, a dedication. Probably was it last month with uh, our nephew, and so you, some of y'all were here for that. But what I said, and I always say, this is is halfway a, a baby dedication or a child dedication. In his case, and, and another part is a parent dedication. Uh, of these guys coming up and say, we are going to do this. We're going to follow the commandments of the Lord in raising our, our son. And so happy Father's Day to you, bro, by the way, by the way. Um, and so God instructs in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7, these commandments I give you today, they're going to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, basically what Moses is writing here is like, do it always. doesn't matter what the, the season is, what the, the occupation is, what, what's going on where you live, what state you're in. Like, it doesn't matter all the circumstances. Everything you do, you're impressing upon him the principles of God. Not just making sure he like knows Ten Commandments, you know, no, 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 no. We're talking about the commandments of God, the instructions of God, the life of a Christian. He says, impress that. It, see, you know, we, we, we live in a culture now that it's almost like it's, it, well, now for a few generations, I will say, it's been impressed on parents to back off and let their kids kind of figure out life. That, that's, that's what animals do. Parents, like, no, no, no. God calls you to impress upon them the principles that will help them navigate their life and make right choices. You know, when, when craziness happens in our culture, we're like, well, I can't believe this happens. And we always try to find the blame of what's causing the problems. I'm going to tell you, it's a culture that has told parents hands off on your kids. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches hands on your kids to impress on them the principles of the kingdom to drive out rebellion. Come on, there's a, a lot of things going on in our culture because a lot of people have never had rebellion driven from them. I mean, you just watch one thing that comes against them and, and disagrees with them or makes them feel like they're not the center of the world and, and their, their life falls apart. They have not had someone impress upon them the principles of God. This is your job. This is why it's a charge to parents just as much as it is a dedication 
of kids because, I mean, the principle here, depending on where you grew up, your background, your religious examples, like there, there are, you know, denominations that sprinkle kids and it's, it's called a baptism. And that's not what we're doing here. We are dedicating our children to God as, as mom and dad. And when you look at this example, it's all through the Bible as they bring rise today. And I'm, I'm looking here, you know, Paul talking to his apprentice, Timothy, and he, he praised Timothy because he said he had the scriptures impressed upon him from a young age, taught to him by his mom and his, his grandmother. Like, when you look at these examples of Hannah bringing Samuel to the temple to dedicate him to God, he was an answer to prayer. But the biggest thing when it comes to parenting is you have got to start with the premise that he is not yours. It belongs to God. And God has entrusted rise in your care to impress his principles upon his heart. And that as he grows up, he's going to grow up in, as scripture says, the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Literally, it talks as if rise was a, a think of like a, a block of wood that you were sculpting. You were helping to chisel off everything that God didn't intend for his life. And you're molding him into the man of God, the future husband, the future uh, father that he is going to be. God has entrusted him to your care to do that. You know, oftentimes we just kind of went through a graduation and, you know, the, the square, the mortarboard that, that people wear as they graduate. A lot of people don't understand the principle. As a mortarboard, if you're a, a mason, you, you, it, it's, the, it's the thing you use to, to build with. And, and, and ultimately, it's supposed to represent when a graduate high school or I guess you can go back to kindergarten. They, they wear some in the little white, white gowns and caps. But, but the idea of high school or college is that I, am a now, I now am a builder of society. 18 years old is going to be here before you know it. Now, not to fast forward on mama's heart here, but it's going to be here before you know it. Don't miss a moment, a chance to impress upon this man of God. That's what you, you're creating a man of God that is going to lead the world. Come on. He's going to be a game changer in his generation because he's got you as parents because you're bringing him up in church. Yeah, tell him. That's right, rise. Exactly. That's like, yeah, preach it. You just want to preach? Go, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. But this idea of, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, I mean, his, his main crew, you know, parents are bringing their kids to Jesus and wanting him to bless them. And, and, and Sopper's like, no, get, get the kids away from Jesus. No, Jesus is like, let the children come to me. This is the kingdom. This is, this is who steps into the kingdom. The, those that are innocent of heart and pure. And, you know, it's, it's a, he's a blank slate for you to impart and press on him the truths of the kingdom. What a beautiful example, picture of what God's given to you as parents and what we celebrate even today as Father's Day. Isaiah prophesies forward just thinking, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. Rise, you were created to display the glory of God. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Come on, that's parents. That's our job. That's our responsibility to raise our kids up to be world changers. Be world changers. And so here is Hannah, well, even you look at Mary and Joseph, they brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate. When, when we represent, we're, we're not God, we're just as pastors representing the leadership of the church. We're going we're gonna to pray over rise, and so we're going to ask you, and hopefully uh, he's good with, with Pastor Missy. We'll, we'll try it out. We'll see. He's great with it. I like that. I like that. And so Pastor Missy's going to pray over big boy rise here and Whatever's in her heart, she's going to pray, and then we're going we're gonna to pray as a church family over these parents. Can we all join with me? Well, Father God, we thank you so much for this beautiful, beautiful heart yeah. that is pure before you. I thank you that he has eyes to see you, God. I thank you that that will never be tainted, that his ability to hear and see you, God, will remain intact all the days of his life. God, I ask that your hand of protection be on him, that your word would be a light to him, that we, he would be drawn to your word, and he would speak it out clearly and boldly, 
to those that are around him declaring the good things of God. I thank you for your purpose and your plan that it's good for him and the specific path you've got for him to walk on. God, I ask that you illuminate it not only to him, but to mom and dad, that it is clear, that it's concise, that each step they will know it, that the peace of God would guard their heart. Even if it looks challenging for him, they will know that you've got him. They will believe in that. God, we just thank you for that. We thank you for your wisdom that's on this man, that's locked up in his heart, God, that it's being opened up. Thank you for the honor and privilege of getting to see this young man become who you meant for him to be. And God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I seriously think he's about to take that mic and start, start preaching. As representatives of God, obviously he is entrusted rise to you, so we hand him back and we're gonna we're gonna pray over you guys as a family. I'm gonna ask you guys if you join us to just go ahead and stand up and uh, if you don't mind, you don't want to reach your hand out, that's fine. It just as a point of contact, we're gonna lay hands on them. And Father God, we just thank you right now as as your church, God, that these guys are a gift to us. They're a gift to the world, they're a gift to this community. God, we consider it an honor that we get to journey together. And so, God, we pray over Ryan and Mercedes, and father and mother. God, I thank you that they are gifted, anointed, and appointed by you to raise a rise in this generation. We bind every voice of fear that has come against them to, to discredit their abilities to cause them to doubt what what they can and cannot do. Just, God, that you are a good, good father and you are leading them. Jesus, you're a good shepherd and you're restoring soul, you're restoring stories. God, you're you're making this uh, 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 story of of, of not only uh, of of redemption, but God, of salvation, of, of freedom. Oh, God, of restoration, and I just thank you that you've given them the ability the, the, that they can do all things through Christ. It includes parenting. Because you strengthen them. Greater is he that's in you, Ryan, yeah. in you, Mercedes, than he that's in the world in any season and circumstance that no weapon formed against this family will prosper. Oh, every tongue that rises against you will be silenced weapon will fall. And so God, I thank you for your your covering of protection, God, as they operate the principles of your kingdom, God, that they see the abundance in this season of life. They see your provision in the next season of life. You, God, they just are in awe of how you lead them and care for them so well. And God, that they will lead to through other families that need to see what, what a God who is, is, is like you can do. Oh, God, I thank you for Ryan as he leads his family, God, that he carries that mantle. Father, leader. So, God, we we dedicate them today, this whole family, to you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Oh, thank you for your faithfulness and your love for them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, come on. Let's uh, let's celebrate these guys. Let's have... So it's baby's first Bible, and then for all the uh, first-time dedication stuff, uh, pastor that changed our lives and, and, and taught us how to raise our kids. It's a book he wrote, and, uh, and we, uh, we apply principles to all three. They're still smiling, I think. Yeah, all right, so maybe that'll help you. All right, one more time. Give them a hand as they take a, take a seat and take a rise to go ahead.
Good morning, and welcome to Highway Community Church. If we haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Daniela, and I'm one of the leaders here at Highway. And our desire is to be a life-giving church in Northwest Denver, where you are known by others, the Holy Spirit is experienced, and each of us are challenged to become more engaged followers of Jesus. If you're a guest here today, thank you for taking the time to fill out a Connect card. We understand that visiting a new church for the first time can come with a little anxiety, so it means a lot to us that you're here. Welcome home. No matter where you are in the journey, if you want to go deeper in your spiritual growth, we encourage you to check out our website at highwaycommunity.com for the welcome information, on-ramp videos, blogs, events, and life group details. So now that we've experienced God's presence this morning in worship, let's prepare our hearts to receive from His Word today. If you have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, feel free to look up today's service on the events tab and follow along with the notes provided. Let's watch this quick video and welcome today's speaker. Good morning, Highway. Man, uh, it is good to see you guys in the house. Let's go ahead and welcome those joining online with us and uh, wherever you are in the world. Happy Father's Day. Come on, happy Father's Day. If you're in the house, so let me talk to these guys. We recognize right now, just so you know, and not to distract you, it's about 80 degrees right in the, in the room. We get it. We get it. It's warm. Uh, we've let maintenance know. we got a few fans circulating, uh, some air here. So if you need uh, another fan, just... Uh, yeah, I don't know, grab a book or something like that, but we're, we're going to press through. Are you with me? Are we good? Are we good? So we recognize it is, it is a warm morning in here, uh, and so, uh, so I, I want to acknowledge that. Just make sure everybody knows, uh, and uh, we were trying to get that fixed, hopefully that this week for uh, next week, but come on, it's Father's Day, and I recognize, you know, d depending on where you're at in life, you know, maybe you are a father, maybe uh, you know a father, maybe you have a father. Uh, we also recognize there's some people that don't have a natural dad right now to journey with, or they had a natural dad and, and had a hard relationship, or still do, and so we recognize there's a lot of different things at play when it comes to Mother's Day and Father's Day, and so we recognize all that, but we really want to celebrate you dads. Come on, give it up for good dads, and the house. Uh, so uh, appreciate that. You know, for for me, it was a little bit of, a little bit of craziness this morning, and Eric, Eric can testify to craziness. Uh, so just applied Eric, like they just fixed an air-conditioned unit at their house this morning. He rushed down here, got on stage, like, so I mean, happy Father's Day, Eric, you know. Uh, Wait, wait a day to kick it off, you know, but uh, the craziness of it, I have not got to call my dad, so as soon as this is over, we leave here, dad, and we'll give you a call, so I don't know if you'll watch this before I call him or vice versa, but uh, happy Father's Day, I honor you, thank you for all that you've done in part to, to us and your kids and, and your grandkids and our family, so we just want to say thank you to that, and in our house, now, now maybe your house, uh, you've heard the phrase dad joke, right, everybody heard that, uh, in our house, we just call it Crowder jokes, it just it's run in the family. I don't know. I mean, you know, so uh, I just feel like, you know, I would, be, I would do a disservice to us if I didn't just kind of start with a few things that we need to understand when it comes to life and, uh, you know, talking out things with your spouse, which you should do. And, you know, my wife said I, I should do lunges to stay in shape. And, you know, that would be a big step forward. Um, you know, so uh, two, I love golf. Uh, when I play golf, I usually take an extra pair of socks. And that's typically because, you know, if, if I get a hole in one, I'll have the extra and stuff. Um, and so, you know, what do you call a fish wearing a bow tie? I mean, this is good trivia to know in life and, and in case you're out fishing. But if you randomly caught a fish at a bow tie, uh, it, would, it would definitely be sophisticated, you know, um, type, type deal. So, um, all right, anyway, here we go. So, uh, man, Pastor Eric did a great job last week. And in case you missed any of those, those were dad jokes, all right? Uh, but Isaiah 43, 16 says, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea 
and a path through the mighty waters. God is our good, good Father. As we have already started today, great job, worship team, leading us into singing uh, those principles, those thoughts. Uh, you know, there's seasons that we're unable to see our full potential or what we could become in life. Our perspective gets clouded, uh, you know, especially when it comes to other people's opinions. Uh, everybody has an opinion. Everybody wants to share their opinion. Uh, but also there's times where it comes through our, our filters, our past failures, our, our regrets. I mean, it's, as a dad, I have some regrets. I've talked to my kids about things I missed out in the last uh, decade of, of so much attention trying to get a, a church started that there's things I missed as a dad in their, in their journey. And so so I appreciate their forgiveness, uh, but there's times we can live with the regrets of, of anything, you know, and that becomes our filter. It, it can affect the way we lead, uh, the way we parent, the way we do relationships. I mean, it can, it can affect how we relate to, to complete strangers sometimes when that's our filter. And so we started last week, and we're unpacking just in these two weeks this story of this man, the Bible, who also wrestled with his own abilities, identity, his insecurities. Uh, and in the process, him wrestling that, he had to step out in faith to obey God in a really big calling. You know what I'm saying? And, and so this man, Moses, as we started unpacking last week, it, it gave us the principle that God can use someone who's ordinary to do extraordinary things. You know, oftentimes we so quickly discredit ourselves from the use that God can take us and make something of our life. And it doesn't matter the age. So we're going to even dive in and talk a little bit today. God took Moses on a journey of self-discovery. And so no matter if you're young or you're old in this room or watching online, this message today applies to you. This principle applies to you. We were created for more. Just say it. Say, I was created for more. Come on, let's say, I want to grow. God, you have more. I want to know it. Like I said, Pastor Eric did a great job kind of opening up the, the, the door and us looking into the story of Moses and seeing some things that shaped his life. And just to, to recap or maybe give you a little more trivia, so Moses was born of the tribe of Levi. Both mom and dad were Levites. He was, uh, in the sense you, you heard, he was put in a basket post in the Nile River because of the mandates of Pharaoh to kill all the male uh, children. And so Jochebed, his mom, Amram and Jochebed, uh, Jaca, Jacobet are the parents, and, and so she puts him in the basket, puts him in the Nile River, just trusting God to take care of him. Literally, you know, think about trying to hide a kid for, I don't know, it was like three months, three years, I don't know what it was, like forever, uh, you know, trying to hide a, a baby boy, and it just got to the place where we can't hide him anymore. And so you look at Moses' life and, and what happened, he, he's discovered by, by Pharaoh's daughter who's, who's bathing in the Nile, and she sees the baby and wants to adopt the baby. And, and, and you know, just uh, con con conveniently, Sister Miriam's over in the, uh, the, the reeds and runs up and, hey, do you want me to find a Hebrew caretaker for this baby? You know, and, uh, you know, common sense would be like, how did you know the baby? You know, like... But ends up, Jochebed and Amram, for years, get to raise their own son. You talk about God's protection and provision in a story in the Old Testament. Right here, they get the joy. Yes, they have to eventually say goodbye for him to go live in the palace and be in the care of, uh, of Pharaoh's daughter as, uh, you know, a mother, adoptive mother. And so, yes, there's a lot of, a lot of crazy moving parts here. But when you heard the story that Eric gave last week of Moses killing the Egyptian taskmaster, he was 40 years of age, and he flees Egypt at 40. Now I'm going on 46, and I'm just thinking through my life, and, and I, I love reading, and, and at the leadership training the other day, uh, you know, we were talking about books, and so like I'm in, I'm in the middle of starting a book by Bob Buford called Halftime, equating, you know, the life of a guy to, to a game, and you know, you hit this certain age, you're kind of like in the middle where, you know, for a lot of years, you're, you're wanting just to be successful, and he says there gets a point in time in a man's life, and like I said, going on 46 this year, that all of a sudden you're like, well, you know, is it successful or do I want to live a life of significance? And so I look at Moses' life, and he's 40 right here, and he has been in Pharaoh's house, in the palace, trained by the greatest um, professors of that time. I mean, you just think about it. For him to stand in front of God and, like, say, I can't talk. I, I, I have this, this speech impediment or whatever. It is. Like, he has been trained by the most brilliant minds 
of the world. He's been in the, the palace under the best care. He has been pampered. He is a prince of Egypt, as some of you all might remember a cartoon with that title. And you look at this example and you fast forward to when he stands before the burning bush and eventually stands again in Egypt before Pharaoh. He is 80 years old when he stands in Pharaoh's court again. His brother Aaron, who is the mouthpiece God appoints this team, dynamic duo, Aaron is 83. Puts a whole different picture than what the, 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 the cartoons and the movies. I mean, like, now you're, you're, you're thinking a different image of 80 and 83 walking into Pharaoh's court here. By this time, you look at the life of Moses. He's used to the shepherd life. Hey, he's just got his flock. He's taken care of. He's got a wife, Zipporah, two sons, Gershom and Eliezer. And you look at this moment, and it's like, okay, God, I'm supposed to go back to Egypt. I'm, like, comfortable. I've got a life here. I've got, you see, when you really frame it, the reality of this moment of what he's processing So it looks like in Exodus 4, he's going to take Zipporah and sons and head with Aaron to Egypt. And there's this moment, this craziness. Like like when you read the story, you don't fully get all the details of it, but it's kind of like a a declaration. This is a moment that happened, a little craziness, where Zipporah, mom, has to quickly circumcise their son to save Moses' life because God commanded Moses to circumcise his sons. And like this is this is this crazy moment. Moses is sending back his, his mom and sons to, to Midian before he heads to Egypt. And so you look at this moment, most scholars believe this is where, you fast forward to where Jethro eventually brings Zipporah and his sons back to meet him at the mountain of God. See, this is why he didn't just take, you know, Zipporah and the, the boys, hey, let's go on a field trip to Egypt and set people free. Like, like you, you look at this story, there's, there's a lot of things that we're unpacking in these ideas in the story of Moses. When you look at this idea of made for more and we're celebrating fathers, I think it's really easy to take the life of Moses and start connecting some dots to leadership and made for more. When you look at our own abilities, yes. Moses, he, he questions his own ability, probably has a, a massive list of, of filters of regrets, maybe a little bit of abandonment issue. Like, I don't know what all he's processing here, but you look at this moment in front of the fiery bush, and angel and God, and all this is going down, he's getting voluntold what to do. You ever been there? Like, he's not like signing up like, hey, what can I do for God on a really, really big level this time of my life? Like, he's getting voluntold. And Moses here, no matter how you view his life, I will tell you through the story, what unfolds after that, he is a phenomenal leader. He's a phenomenal leader. You know, I was thinking about this, uh, honoring my dad for Father's Day, and we'll get to talk later, and I can ask him some questions here, but my dad turned 80 this year. I don't, I don't know if, if, if dad would be like, yes, yeah, sign me up, God. I want to lead a few million people through a wilderness. That sounds fun, you know, and maybe, maybe he would. I don't know what my mom would say about that, but like, you know, 80 years old, this is what Moses is doing like he he's about to get unhooked from everything that is comfortable and normal in his life to go in and do this. I think my dad, if God voluntold him, probably would do it, and mom would come along with it. I get that, but but it's challenging when you really frame this in the right perspective. There are always and will always be leadership roles that are thrust upon you that you didn't ask for. There's going to be moments, whether it's at work, whether it's in your family. Fatherhood, come on, fatherhood, what a great example of a role. Now, you got to lead. I mean, you can be the absentee father and scar your kids, and they have father wounds all their life. Like, yes, that can be an option, but when you have that position, you step up and you lead. You change the world. Even, even Proverbs talks about, like, like, being a father is like having a quiver full of arrows, and you're shooting the arrows into the future generations to change the world. That's the imagery and a fulfillment of of being a father is having those kids. 
Obviously, I can say, you know, we've got one not here with us. He's in Atlanta, but as a father of three, like, that, this is our greatest joy. I, I know Missy's a mom, but, but it's Father's Day, so I get to say, greatest joy, like, like the, what they're doing in life, the success, it, it, it honors me as a dad. Well, I get to honor my dad. I especially get to honor my Heavenly Father. As we have discussed and talked about recent months of how he looked at his son who's getting baptized in the Jordan, and the father's voice speaks. Come on, fathers, you got to speak. And he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The beauty of that was not because Jesus has done all these grandiose things up to that point in time. He's age 30. He hasn't performed a miracle, and yet God says, I am well pleased. Come on, we need a father's voice today telling you that he is pleased in you. Age 80, looking at this next season of life, again, this little crisis moment, when I, when I read Scripture and I start really processing, analyzing, and you look at really the reality of this, He's 80, going to Egypt, about to go to Egypt, and mom Zipporah pulls out the kitchen knife to circumcise son. I don't think this is a baby. This is awkward. I mean, you talk about a family crisis. Moses is like, how about y'all go on back to Midian, put a little ice and peroxide on that, and we're going to go on with Uncle Aaron to Egypt. How about we do that? I mean, you talk about handling crisis and moments Moses' life is filled with them, some by his own choice, some by things that just happen. What do we do in those moments when things just happen? And I look at Moses' life, I think, you know, having two-part series, I think his story is broken up into a two-part act. One is the, the backstory, it's the foundation, it's the what has created Moses, and I think the second part is his leadership. Leadership of his family, three things really we're going to unpack today. Leadership of his family, leadership of the Israelites, and leadership of himself. And we talk about this series, Made for More. And so I titled today's message, Lift the Lid. No, we're not talking about the toilet, even though that is a great idea. Lift the lid. Lift the lid of your leadership. Lift the lid of your, the story of Moses gives us some unique principles that helped us lift the lid of our leadership. And this does not just apply to men in the house today or watching a line. This principle, what we're going to unpack of leadership, we, guys, girls, we're all a part of this that we can, uh, we, can, we can grow in our capacity to lead others well. I'm going to invite you to turn to Numbers chapter 12. We're going to read a, a handful of verses here. And there's a few things, like I said, we want to unpack in these minutes we have together Numbers chapter 12, I'm going to look at verse 1. Uh, scripture will be on the screen, uh, obviously in version. if you're uh, in there, as Danielle told us on the, the video earlier. We're going to just jump right in here to a story that's after the deliverance of the Israelites. They are post-Red Sea crossing. There, there's amazing demonstrations of power God has given them. And here's this moment that's, that's challenging Moses's leadership. Starts with Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Okay, again, who's Miriam and Aaron? Brother and sister. Starts with family, all right? Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman who he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And scholars disagree back and forth. Is this Zipporah? Are they, are they labeling her a Cushite as a, as a kind of a, a make fun of? Is, is, they're not sure. Is he taking another uh, wife as well? There, there's all scholars disagree and, and fight on this. You, you don't have to worry about. The principle here is what we're going at. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only to Moses? I mean, you got to get that little snarky sister-brother comment. Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek. Most of the translations say humble. More than all the people are on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Marion, come out, you three. Don't make me pull the car over. Come back there. Like, come out here, all three of you. All three of you right now. Get out here. 
Three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Miriam and Aaron. They both came forward, and he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him a vision, and I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, some some trace of face to face, not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh, oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of the mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit on her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and so after that, she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out of the march till Miriam was brought in again. Okay, to start unpacking this moment where his leadership is challenged by his family, his position, his ability. In verse 3, I really want to camp and look at this for a second because this kind of builds into our first principle. Verse 3, let me read it again. Now the man Moses was very humble, the most humble person on the planet. Can anyone tell me who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses. So who wrote that Moses is the most humble person on the planet. Moses. So if I was up here and I said, just so you all know, I am the most humble person on the planet. Would you be like, man, he, he speaks truth right there. That's true. That's true. No, no. So we read that and we understand who's writing and we're like, that's a little arrogant sounding if I can give my own opinion, right? But the problem is most of us do not fully understand humility. And we tie in what Eric taught us last week and we start looking at this man, Moses, and, and how he's describing himself as this. Moses did not try to defend his position and authority to lead. How many, how many people in, in positions of leadership, management, ownership, uh, you know, like all of a sudden something's going down. Well, I'm the owner. I'm the manager. You better listen. I, 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 I am defending their position and their authority. Moses didn't do that even with his brother and sister, who themselves are the high priest of Israel, and she is a prophetess. I mean, you go back and look through the story, And it calls her a prophet. She leads the people in worship on the other side of the Red Sea. Like these are spiritual leaders in the tribe. And so this is where they've got kind of a little bit of the big head. And they're like, who do you think you are? God uses us too. Moses comes right to their defense, not his own. I mean, do you see this the story? He is crying out to God. Oh, my gosh. Like, God's defending his man, who he called to be the leader. And Moses is championing, healing his sister. The, let, 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 the, no, God, like, like uh, he's fighting for the team while the team is directly opposing him. When you start understanding humility, they got offended in Moses. They use his marriage as an excuse to challenge him, and God comes to defense. Moses says, he, I am the most humble person on the planet. The psalmist talk like this about humility. Psalms 25, 9, he guides, talking about God, guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Psalms 147, 6, the Lord sustains the humble and casts the wicked to the ground. Psalms 149, 4, for the Lord takes the light in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Guys, I'm just, I'm just, just scratching the surface of Scripture that talks about 
Humility. Take a simple definition, dictionary.com, and you'll start seeing why Moses embraced this identity. It says not proud or arrogant, having a feeling of insignificance, inferiority, low in rank, status. Like It makes sense that Moses would view himself in this category because you see it all through the story. God chose Moses to be the leader. Moses is holding this thing open-handed. He's trying to lead with the right heart, the right posture. Majority of the time, I won't say always, people are drawn to leaders who, who are humble as they lead the people underneath them. Carry this responsibility in, in a way that was very unique to the situation. Many times he's, God, why do I have to carry this responsibility? He's not, even through the story, pushing in the front and say, I'm the leader. He's like, God is the one who validates me. He leans on what I think is the greatest strength of leadership, humility. Ezra Benson says, pride is concerned with who is right. Humility is concerned with what is right. You start looking at this idea of humble, and we're talking about made for more. So we're going to say this today. We're going to talk about three more leadership principles. The first is we need to lead. Come on, dads. Come on, moms. We need to lead with more humility. More humility. Isaiah 66, second part, verse 2, the prophet writing, he says, declaring the Lord, these are the ones I I look on with favor. God is speaking through his mouthpiece, the prophet. This is who I'm going to put my favor on right here. Those who are, guess the word, humble, contrite in spirit, who tremble at my word. Jesus teaching recorded by Matthew in chapter 23, 12. For those who exalt themselves, Jesus talking, they're going to be humbled. And those who humble themselves, it's a promise from Jesus, will be exalted. Disciples write about it. You can keep looking all through the scripture. Paul talking to Ephesus, Ephesians 4, 2. Be, church, be completely humble. Even ties this word, not just try to be a little humble. It says be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. James, half-brother of Jesus, leader in the church, chapter 4, 10. Humble yourselves before God, and he will lift you up. Peter, 1 Peter, in his letter 3, 8. Finally, all of you, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Guys, it is all through the book. This idea of humility, we, I believe, should get the point today. God is honoring the humble. The humble. Humble does not mean that you, you, you don't ever defend yourself or you let someone run over your family. Come on, guys. Like, no, you're, you're the defender, the protector. Come on, like, step up. But when it comes to a heart posture, we carry pride or humility. Humility is a primary requirement for leadership by God, but it goes beyond that. It's a requirement for following Jesus here at Highway. What do we talk about all the time? We want to become more engaged followers of Jesus. The the word used in Scripture is a disciple. Uh, We want to engage life like Jesus engaged and interacted with life. Humility is what anybody who modeled it in the book is Jesus. John J. McElroy said, humility leads to strength, not to weakness. It's the highest form of self-respect to admit mistakes and to make amends for them. So ask the question, no matter your man, your woman, whatever age, how often does pride get the best of you? Can you admit mistakes? Come on, dads. Best thing in the world is for you to be able to look at your kids and say, I missed it. Will you Forgive me. You're talking about modeling that for them to be able to see someone doing that? I mean, just look at this idea of of pride. How often does it get the best of us? Keep you from admitting faults. I mean, like, there's many things. Oh, man, in my years of youth ministry, I don't know how many times I'd have to go in the office of the lead pastor and like, I'm sorry what I did. Yeah, we're going to have to fix the brand new carpet that I spray painted in the fellowship hall. I mean, like, I can go down a list of many things 
that I had to learn, just admit it. I missed it. I, 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 it's a hard one for many people to crucify this thing called pride. A little, little Bible trivia for you. I'm going to quote a first part of a verse. Don't, don't put it up yet. Pride goes before. Say it loud. Wrong. See, all of us hear that and it's quoted, pride goes before a fall. No, it's, it's actually worse than that. Pride goes before destruction. Haughty spirit will get you fallen. Pride leads to destruction. Come on, dads, moms, like we've got to kill this thing called pride because it's going to keep you from being a life source in your home. It's going to keep you from, from bringing Jesus into the workplace. Come on, we need people that can crucify pride. Pride will always destroy your ability to lead every time. Every time. So let's learn how to live and model humility and lead with the blessing and approval of God. Moses had to learn first how to lead his family. Zipporah, the boys, his sister, his brother. When you start looking at doing ministry with family, there's, there's some challenges that can come with that. And Moses led with humility. Moses also had to learn to lead others. You think leading families hard, try leading others. A few million people in the desert, kind of hard. So if you ever have led someone else, you're going to come to a moment you're facing this thing called criticism. Ever been there? Anybody ever criticized something you did? Some of you, you had the best intentions, even. You worked so hard on that project, or you tried your best to come through in that situation, and yet you get the big C. Criticism. Ever been there? Anybody? Anybody? Come on, just be honest. Yes. Criticism. Nobody, and I mean nobody, likes to be criticized. Like, please, tell me something I'm doing wrong. That sounds so nice. But yet, as we dive in soon into principles of wisdom, Scripture tells us to crave it. Now, when you think about this, how you handle it makes all the difference. Criticism comes. Are we defensive? Pride raises up. I, I can't admit I did wrong. I was right in that situation. I had the best intentions. Like, you should just get over it. I mean, we, we, what is our defense mechanism in that moment that rises to the surface and pushes back? Because how we, how we defend ourselves, how we handle that moment, listen, that could be the best thing ever. Someone trying to be honest to get you to see your blind spot you could not see. The pride, again, that's why we start with humility, will cause you to stiff arm criticism. Think about criticism, I mean, you know, we, We've got to consider the source. I think that's wise. Is this someone who, who really cares about you, who has your best interests at heart, that wants you to be an improved version of yourself? You, you need to be fully aware that person has your back and you need to listen to what they're telling you you could do better at. But yet, there are people, they just are mean-spirited, they're bitter, they're hurt, hurt people, hurt people, come on. And so you, you look at the situation, it could be just, it needs to be something like, you know, water off a duck's back kind of thing. You're like, I appreciate your concern, and just let it be that. Just take it as a grain of salt. I know they're in a bad place, it's not a good season for them, and they're just, they're just angry anyway. So process that. But ultimately, when it comes to state criticism, we need to be able to look at it through the correct lens. This is something I need to learn from. Because if you go from job to job to job to job, and there's the same critique, causing oftentimes you to lose the job, you need to pay attention. It may not be every manager and boss you have is bad. It may need to have some changes in your work ethic. You might need to get on being there in time, working hard, not being on your phone all the time, taking longer breaks than you should. Like, again, well, I just think they're an overbearing, mm, stop. Is there a critique that you need to pay attention to that will embedder your life, make you a better leader, a better worker, a better son, a better daughter, a better, you, I mean, the list goes on. Better husband, a better wife. Look through the rep lens. 
football coach, famous Lou Holtz. I think he's right on when it comes to wisdom when he said it this way. You're never as good as anyone tells you when you win, and you're never as bad as they say when you lose. you got to understand criticism. It's going to come. The crowd is fickle, period. You look at sports, you look at politics, you look at Jesus. He could gather a crowd, but the moment he started teaching something that challenged him a little too much, he literally has to look at his disciples like, you going to leave me too? Because all of them just left. See, the crowd is fickle. There'll always be someone when you're the greatest person ever and your head swell. No, 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 no. Just take it a grain of salt. Like, thank you. I appreciate that compliment. That's great. But don't let it get you the big head. Say. So you start looking at Moses and this idea of criticism. From Egypt all the way to the promised land. Documented moment after moment after moment, the people God told Moses to lead criticized his leadership. Let's go, let's go to Exodus. Let's look at chapter 5. I'm just going to give you two where we actually read a few verses, and then I'm just going to kind of bullet point some of the story highlights. Chapter 5, verse 20 through 23. Let's do those three verses. Then Moses and Aaron, who are waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh... And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge you because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. Okay, frame it. Moses, in obedience to God, has just gone to Pharaoh and says, hey, let my people go. You know, like that whole moment. And Pharaoh, this is the very beginning. Pharaoh's like, okay, you're a bunch of lazy slaves. I'm going to increase your labor, labor quota, and you're not going to get the hay and stubble to make the bricks. Peace out. They come out, the leaders of Israel, are like, they are attacking Moses. And Aaron. Like, what in the world? You just made us... Worse in, in Pharaoh's eyes. You know, like the, the very beginning, it is nothing but criticism. Fast forward to Exodus 14, 10 through 12. When Pharaoh drew near, this is at the Red Sea, they actually get out. They're at the Red Sea. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Over and over, you fast forward, Exodus 16, also in Numbers 11, Israelites criticize Moses because they're hungry. Exodus 17, Israelites criticize Moses because they're thirsty. They criticize him for his absence when he goes up into the mountain of God and with God and the presence of God and getting the, the, tablets, the, 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 the tablets of stone and they, they go to Aaron, make us a golden calf, make us an idol, make us a God we can worship. We, we don't know what happened to this guy, Moses. They criticize him for not only having, uh, the, only having bread, they want wanted meat. They criticized him then. Numbers 14, literally when the people disobey God and don't go into the promised land when God said it's theirs and they're punished for 40 years, they get mad at Moses over and over and over and over. Criticism. So, I mean, how do you, how do you live, how do you lead without getting criticized? It's, it's attributed to Aristotle. I'll just, I'll just quote it. Criticism is something we can e avoid easily by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. That is true, but that is not the call of leadership in the church. To be a Christian is to have something to say, something to do, and something to be. So we don't get that option. So in the process, we need to learn more humility in our leadership, but we also need to lead with more conviction. Conviction. That word conviction means a fixed or firm belief. How convicted are you in what you do and what you say and who you are? 
Conviction. Conviction. Are, are you easily uh, uh, able to be swayed depending on the group and who's, who's around you and who you're trying to please? And are you people please? Like we need in leadership, Moses modeled this, we need to have more conviction. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5, Paul wrote this. He said, our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. Conviction. Author of Hebrews chapter 3, 14, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold to our original what? Conviction. Firmly to the end. See, there's got to be a conviction. There's got to be something in you that causes you to be stable. See, that's the stories that are highlighted in the movies or on the news is, is someone that handled a moment of crisis with conviction. They were confident in not maybe their own abilities, but confident that we're going to get through this. Conviction, confidence, holding on to it. We all need it. Sometimes it's so elusive. Hey, well, if I could just be more convicted, like stand my ground. All of a sudden, someone's kind of pushing you to do something that's just a little, little on the moral side, just a little gray. Ah, no one's going to care. No one's looking. No one's watching. No one's going to catch you. No one's going to know. How would they know? See, is there a conviction guiding you? See, see, we've got to ask ourselves, not just in our leadership, but in our followership of Jesus, is there a conviction that you stay true to who you are called to be? Because those, those, those corners that so easily are, we're tempted to cut, guys, those things could be the thing that, that, that lead your leadership to a downfall. Because all of a sudden, there's, there's people, they're finding out news now. Man, you talk about people that dig out stuff like years prior, stuff that they did decades before. Now, especially in cancel culture, like you talk about consequences, reaping of decisions that they thought they got away with. Conviction. How do you talk about yourself, your ability, what you can do, confidence? I think it's, I think it's attributed to Gandhi, but let me just, this, I thought it was interesting, his thought on this. Man often becomes what he believes himself to be. If I keep on saying to myself that I cannot do a certain thing, it is possible that I may end by really becoming incapable of doing it. On the contrary, if I have the belief that I can do it, I shall surely acquire the capacity to do it, even if I may not have it at the beginning. How do we build belief in ourselves? I was just thinking, you know, we need those wins, those little moments where we conquer temptation. I mean, when we do the fast coming up in, in August, we're going we're gonna to do that 10-day fast for the first time ever. We, every January, we do a 21-day fast. And you talk about bringing the voice of the flesh and crucifying it. Like, that's a win when you can realize, man, look what I can overcome. Maybe, maybe that'll be first time for some of y'all ever do 10 days of, of fasting and prayer. And, you know, as we get towards that, we'll talk more. But, but we need moments. It's like we can just like put a, a knock on the bell. Like, like man, we, we have done this. We've done it right. I've won. I, I got that job. I kept that job. I got a raise. I, whatever it is, man, we've got to have moments that we're looking at. I can do this. I can do this. Belief in ourselves, But more than that, what we've got to find is, is something that we uniquely have in our journey as Christians. We have a relationship with God, a God who is greater then. I mean, just think about we, as we prayed over these guys and their dedication, like a God that is greater, greater is he that is in you. The spirit of Christ that raised from the dead, that's, that's who's in you, who's greater than the world, the, the opposing forces outside. Moses, here, here's what I, I termed it this way. Moses' calling was his conviction. Because we already heard he wrestled with his own ability. What kept him on the course? His calling by God. See, when you start realizing it's God that calls, therefore it's God that equips. God appoints and God anoints. So you start looking at these ideas. His confidence rested not in his ability to do, but in God's power and faithfulness to come through. And that confidence, that's what compelled him. That's what compelled him. He interacted with God face to face, and that's why he didn't shy away with jumping in the middle of it and say, whoa, 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 God, do not kill them. Do not wipe them out. 
He had that kind of relationship as intercessor, as mediator. He's a picture, a type of Jesus going to the cross and presenting his blood in the holy holies of heaven and saying, this is the thing that stands on behalf of humanity to the Father. That's why we're, we're seeing through that lens. Moses is a type of a Savior who's a mediator, who's, who's an intercessor for the people. Now, he's imperfect model because there are moments in the story he's like, God, wipe them out. Kill them all. Kill them all. I'm tired of them. Like, you know, so he has his moments, as all of us do. But as a father and a leader, he modeled conviction. He also had to learn not just to lead his family, to lead other people. He had to learn to lead himself. Sometimes that's our challenge. You know, thinking through how easy it is oftentimes for us to criticize our bosses, our managers, politicians. Come on. How easy it is that, well, look, if I was in, what would I, you know, like, we, we get, we, it, it's easy. But if we turn that same lens towards ourselves, how well do you lead yourself? Self-government is the beginning of all public office. Can you lead yourself? And I know a few, few years back, we, we had a culture that bought into the lie that the public image and the private, like those are two separate, you don't, you don't tie the two. No, your private life will dictate how you lead publicly. It'll, it'll take you down. It'll, it'll cause God to exalt you, 100%. Thomas Jefferson said this, sometimes it is said that man cannot be trusted with government of himself. Can he then be trusted with the government of others? we got to learn to lead ourselves. So what does that mean? We've got to have self-awareness. We, we've got to, to be able to, to be self-motivated. How hard is that? To get up, to go, to do, especially when it's a routine that you're tired of, you're frustrated, you're tired of the criticism that comes with it. See, see, that's the opposition. That's, that's when you stand the test, when you have conviction and you can push through the, the things that are resisting. Life resists. Come on. Our flesh resists. It wants to sleep one more hour and then the next hour. It's drawn to binge watching online. It's just, I just need, see, the flesh, it's strong. It's loud. Oh, my gosh. It does not shut up. Self-government. I'm just thinking, you know, I don't know. We're talking about government, but we're, we're in the story. Talking about Moses. I don't know if you're aware of this in, in Congress. Uh, the, 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 there's a marble. I'll just, I'll just read this. is a marble sculpture of Moses. It's hung in Congress in the Capitol since 1950 as part of a series of 23 portraits chosen to represent historical figures who established the legal principles underlying the American system of government. Moses is in the center. That's what it looks like. 11 different other portraits are facing him. Moses is significant. When you start looking at the story of Moses, what's impact as we come into what we're going to give our, our third and last principle is why so often when you hear people talk about America being founded on Judeo-Christian principles, Judeo, Ju Judaism, Jewish law, Moses. Moses is a key principle in the founding understanding of even our government. In case you think if you have a marble statue carved out of you, you've arrived, Moses had to improve his leadership too. We all have blind spots. There's this moment in Exodus 18 where Moses' father, Jeth Jethro, his father-in-law, brings the poor, brings the boys, comes out to the mountain of God. Moses thinks he's going to impress him by showing him all, telling him all the story of what God's done, showing him every day I sit in a place of judgment. I'm a judge, and everybody in the whole tribe comes to me to help me pass judgment on situations to help people navigate. And Jethro, in his wisdom, verse 17, 18, his father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you, you're certainly going to wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. The third and last thought here is we need to lead with more delegation. 
Come on, we're talking about made for more. Moses would not have got into the fullness of what God called him to if he did not learn this last leadership principle. You're made for more, but you're not made to do it alone. Made for more. You need other people's help. Whether it's at work, ministry, home, one of the greatest strengths in leadership can be your ability to delegate, to empower someone else. And I didn't say dictate, I said delegate, delegate. Me on the Enneagram, I'm an eight, a number eight. I'm a challenger. I, I want to push, I want to push. But when I'm unhealthy, I control. I don't delegate well. I'm self-aware of that. If, if I'm unhealthy, I, I, I've, got, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. I've got to do it. I can't, I can't hate. How might you go do this? I need you to do this. But when I'm healthy, I can. Moses, look at this. Verse 24, 25. Moses listened. Come on, guys. How many of you would listen to your father-in-law's advice? I'm called by God. Thank you, Jethro. Pops. Who are you? Where were you when we crossed the Red Sea? Where were you at the Nile River coming out here now telling me how to run my business? Moses listened. See, the key to learning to delegate is you got to listen. Listen. Listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and tens. And they would meet with those groups and they would be the judge. And more more or less, Moses was the Supreme Court. See, this is our judicial system. This is why he's accredited. Most of our early law givers in America, most of everything in the founding fathers was, was quoted when it comes to law was based off of writings of Moses more than anything else. He is cited in law books more than any other historical figure because they understood God showed them how to judge the people. And it was Moses' father-in-law that told him how to do it. Also in Numbers 11, you fast forward, there's this moment, God gives Moses more help, and God says to, the, to, to Moses, gather for me 70 men of elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people, officers over them, bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there. I will come down and talk with you there. I will take some of the spear that's on you and put on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you might not bear it yourself alone. See, he got this. Like, I, I need help to lead. So no matter where you are, come on. Guys, fathers, you feel like you didn't have a good example? There's men in this house that can help you, can mentor you. Come on, girls. I don't know how to, how to navigate this season of parenting. There's some women in this house that have gone through that and conquered and won, and, and they can speak wisdom into you. got mentors, bosses, people that are in your field of business that you can research, you can talk to, that you can find answers to. Listen, you were made for more, but you need people's help to get there. It's Moses was made for more than shepherding a small herd on the side of a mountain in Midian. He could not get there in learning how to lead millions without help. He needed to understand humility. He, he needed to lead with conviction. He needed to learn how to delegate. This, this Father's Day, these principles apply to all of us, not, not just dads. Well, men, men, you were made for more. You can't do it alone. Ladies, you were made for more, but you cannot do it alone. You need people. You need help. You need a tribe. You need to be surrounded with brothers and sisters who are in your corner, who are championing you and cheering you on and challenging you and speaking into your blind spots and causing you to become a better version of who God created you to be. You need, and I need that desperately. When I want to plug, we, we send out today, I already sent an email kind of explaining, but we send out today a couple of invites to, to Family Life Group that's happening next week. You'll have an option this month, next month, I think we have three options, but this one, Tuesday night, uh, up at the Phelan's house, Wednesday night at the, the guy's house here in Broomfield, uh, you'll have a couple options. I'm gonna encourage you, I'm gonna challenge you. 
If you can, be at one of those. No agenda. Bring food. I guess food is an agenda. It's a really good agenda. We're just going to like break bread together. We're just going to do life. That's what I call family life group. It's, it's, it's for families, for singles, for, it's for all ages. We're just coming together. Just pick one of the places. It, it, you, I mean, you don't, you can live in Broomfield and you can go up to Firestone, right? Fre- okay, Firestone, Frederick. Get those two Fs. Firestone. Just whatever works with your schedule, just pick one. But I want you to RSVP to both emails. Say, say yes to one or maybe or whatever. Say no to the other one. Just, just pick one. And we're just gonna we're just gonna build on this principle. Let's do life together. Like that's the imagery of the church. That's what we're supposed to do. They met in the temple, met from house to house. They they did life together. So we all commit to that. That's that's kind of my first thought. Is just commit to respond to an email. Just say yes, say no, say maybe. And then plan to come and bring a little food to share. How about that? Life group. The second thing I want to plug is next week, and I've kind of alluded to it. We're going to kick off a, a summer-long series in the book of Proverbs called Summer Wise, Summer Not. It's going to be good. Some of y'all, it'll hit you. All right. I just thought Father's Day is a great day to announce the Father's Day. Now go ahead and stand with me. And yes, that is my favorite title of the whole year. Leadership. It's, it's not the call for the faint of heart. It, it challenges us. Word challenges us. No matter where we are in our spiritual journey, we all have room to grow. You're made for more. Just open your hands. I'm going to pray over you, and then we're going to we're going to take a moment, just to, just a couple of minutes. Worship team, come on back up. We're going to we're just going to respond to God. Father, we thank you for being such a good God. Your faithfulness, we celebrate. Your patience, we celebrate. Your love, we we celebrate. We're so grateful. God, we desire your presence. Our passion is for your presence. And and King David wrote in the Psalms that we enter into your, your presence with thanksgiving, with gratitude. God, as we take this moment here to respond, we go to these tables of communion and we understand different churches call it different things, Last Supper or communion or the Eucharist. Or God, we just understand it's a place of gratitude that we meet with you, talk to you. We thank you. Help us each one here, no matter where we are in the journey, that we, we grow We grow in our capacity. God, I just say increase to leadership capacity in this house and those watching online today. We're made for more. We can carry more. We can conquer more. We can press through and overcome more in the name of Jesus because you are with us. And that calling on our lives is our conviction and we are so grateful name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, church. We're going we're gonna to respond now. We're going to worship. We're going to go to these tables in the, in the room, have communion, and then Pastor Missy will come up and dismiss us in just a few minutes. Let's do that now.